being here. My name is Kimberly Tate Malone, and I'm one of the reference and instructional librarians here. So I see some familiar faces, but a lot of new faces. How many folks have been to a COSI before? Yeah? Okay. Well, for those who are here for the first time, the library holds this series every single Thursday, except holidays, um, for because we want everyone to have access to a wide range of perspectives so that we can learn and grow from the expertise of our community, including faculty, staff, students, right? So we've had students like these in the past, and I'm just actually getting ready to get the spring schedule together. So if you are um, set on fire by this presentation and have a topic that you're passionate about, come talk to me and we can get you, talk about getting you on the schedule. You'll notice we have a number of resources related but not identical to the topic we'll be discussing today. Feel free to check any of these out. I know some folks are here for class, so it might be related to the assignments that you have. Next week, Zola Mumford, who's a North Seattle College librarian and the curator of the Langston Hughes African American Film Festival, is going to be leading a session on readings and interpretations of blackness in film. So I hope to see you next week, but I'm so glad that you're here this week. And I want to welcome Jose Ochoa, political science faculty as we discuss link, faith, race, and political mobilization. So please give a warm welcome to Jose. Thank you. Yes, I just want to say thank you for taking time and being here. Um, today's topic uh, kind of builds on some of the other, other talks that you've had uh, here. So again, we'll get into what link faith is, what race has to do with political mobilization and political participation and so on. And hopefully I'm able to uh, uh, connect those in a pretty uh, concise and clear way for you all. Um, so kind of over overview of what we'll be doing today is I kind of will go over a lot of heavy like theory uh, theory uh, elements to it. But ultimately we'll, we'll end with a uh, exercise time permitted. So we'll go over racialized uh, group. So we'll go over theory of group membership. Uh, why do people? Why do people like to associate themselves with different organizations, different groups? You know, it doesn't really necessarily have to be based on race, ethnicity. It can also be gender, sexuality, religion, uh, even team sports or anything else like that. Right? We'll go and in, get into um, how do we come to being uh, creating racialized groups. And one thing that I would want to mention, kind of off the back, is this is in the U.S. content context um, as well. Um, so we'll get into identity to politics. So how do we make the leap from identity in terms of how we associate ourselves to actual political participation? Um, and we'll end with political mobilization. Again, like I said, time permitting, we'll get into a uh, group exercise um, that will really kind of emphasize uh, some, of, some of the elements and themes that we'll be talking uh, about here today. Um, so I want to start off with, with this figure here. So the 2016 presidential elections were uh, very notable for many different reasons. We had the first time a woman was uh, uh, the nominee for a major uh, political party. Um, uh, we also had Donald Trump and his, you know, um, his characteristics that went with that, the controversy that surrounded with him. Um, but one thing that I kind of want to show you here is if we look at the exit polls or how people voted in the 2016 election, uh, we can see that African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, and people that identify as an other race or mixed race, in majority voted for Hillary Clinton and not for Donald Trump. Um, if we break it down by race and gender, so if we kind of take an intersectional approach, we see that, the, again, uh, the uh, only groups that voted for Donald Trump were white men and white women. Again, black men, black women, Latino men, Latino women, and others voted in majorities for uh, Hillary Clinton, right? So again, we'll kind of like reverse engineer this and kind of get at like, why did this happen, right? Um, was it that just, uh, again, was it that Donald Trump just didn't uh, cater to any of these groups? Um, but if that's the case, why do we see broad majorities, right? If we look at specifically black women, 94% voted for Hillary Clinton, right? Um, so again, we'll kind of reverse engineer this and kind of get into why do certain groups, in this case racialized groups, vote in almost unison, right? We vote in, uh, in, in big majority voting blocks for particular candidates and support particular issues. 
Um, one thing I also want to mention is at any time, please stop me if you want something clarified. At any time, if you want to you know, ask a question, please do it. I mean, I would also very much encourage any kind of like challenge or pushback to the ideas I'm, I'm, I'm presenting here for sure. Um, I always like uh, I, uh, new perspectives in the way uh, I, I, uh, I engage in material for sure. So again, I kind of just kind of keep this in the back of your mind as, as, as you go through, right? So, kind of just getting some, laying some, some foundations in terms of how do we self-sort each other into different particular groups. So, this is where here group mobilization comes, in, comes into play, specifically so, social identity. So, there is this term in psychology that is called social identity theory. Basically, what it says is a person's sense of, of who they are based on their group membership. Um, and again, groups can be social class, if you consider yourself um, a lower income, middle class, uh, fluent, or, or whatever. Uh, it can be family as well, right? Uh, your family structure is a traditional nuclear family, is it not traditional? Um, can, and again, like I mentioned, it can also be sports team, right? If you're a diehard Seahawks fan or, or a Patriots fan, maybe. Um, but these, are, these groups are important source of pride and self-esteem, right? So they kind of give us a sense of meaning, a, a sense of why we do a, a certain, you know, engage in certain actions, why we engage with certain social circles, why, why we avoid others, right? Um, but most importantly, uh, again, it provides a sense of belonging to the social world, right? We're, we're social creatures, we like to, you know, be engaged with others, maybe not in, you know, uh, huge numbers all the time, but at least uh, at, throughout our lives we like to engage. Um, but most of the time, what, so a lot of the time what happens is we also identify with political entities, right? Whether they be uh, independent uh, organizations like the National Rifle Association, uh, whether they be with uh, political parties, or whether it be with other interest groups, for example, Sierra Club, advocates for environmental issues and conservation and so forth, right? So we like to uh, engage in, in a multitude of different groups uh, uh, for, for these reasons here. <coughs> So how does it actually manifest itself, right? Um, so we have social categorizations, in-group and out-groups, right? So the in-group would be, um, m most of the time, it's the dominant group in, in a society, right? So if we're in the US context, the in-group would be uh, Anglo-Americans or white individuals, as we, uh, as we uh, typically call, these, call it. The out-group is other minoritized groups, right? Other marginalized groups, again, uh, and in this, uh, this scenario, what we'll, we'll be talking about will be focusing on race itself. So out groups would be African American communities, Latino communities, Asian American communities, and so on, right? Marginalized groups uh, that don't have uh, 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 majorities. Um, so we go from social categorizations to social identification. Again, increased self-image to enhance the status of the group to which we belong to, right? And this will come in a multitude of forms, uh, and we'll, uh, I'll, I'll break this down uh, a bit here as well. Um, and then finally, to social comparisons, um, oftentimes it's characterized that the in-group uh, will discriminate against the out-group. Um, and I want to place an uh, important emphasis on, on discrimination here. Um, and so when we start talking about linked fate and, and political mobilization, discrimination will play a pretty important, important role. And this, at least this is what I'll be arguing for. Yeah, question? Do you have any comments on for social identification and how the in-group and the out-group behaves differently when it comes to enhancing self-image? Yeah, so we'll get, get, get to that here, here in a second in the coming slide. So yes, yeah, so we'll, uh, we'll, uh, I'll discuss in terms of how they actually behave, right? So where does the behavior come from? Um, one thing that uh, what's happening is social comparison. Um, uh, I'll use this as a kind to engage in that question that you just asked here. So I kind of just bear with me, but we'll, I promise you I'll, I'll get to it. Um, so the theory of group mobilization, again, so how do we actually make the leap from not just, you know, uh, identifying with a particular group, but then, uh, you know, making that leap to actually mobilize and, and put, participate, right? So the conventional wisdom, and at least this is in political science, uh, political behavior in the U.S. suggests a positive relationship between uh, group membership and, and political participation. Which is really saying is the more you identify, for example, with the black community, with the Latino community, with the Asian American community, or so on, the more likely you're you're gonna make that that make that lead to actual political participation. And participation can come in a multitude of ways, right? Uh, the, probably the most obvious way is actually voting and election. So like one vote, uh, one uh, one one person will vote. But it can also come in the form of protests, of demonstrations of uh, you know, calling your elected representatives, just making yourself present as, as, a, as a political uh, a person. 
And again, the more identified and linked individuals feel with their particular group, the more likely they are to be active in politics. And again, we'll get into some, some, some of these examples here, uh, but the, really the idea is, and we'll get into linked fate here, here in a bit, um, once uh, affinity to a group is going gonna, is gonna to be the impetus to make that leap to actually participate in, in the political arena. So uh, coming back to uh, uh, the question in terms of how the in-group and out-group actually behave. So at least with racialized uh, group membership is in-groups um, will di oftentimes discriminate the out-group. So the idea here is in politics, uh, the dominant group wants to secure their dominant status, right? Um, again, when it comes to politics, the, the main goal is, at least one of the main goals is to have your values, your beliefs, uh, it's uh, uh, passed into legislation, right? Um, to do that, oftentimes is we marginalize certain groups. So the, and these in this case, what we often see is the in group, in this case, uh, white voting bloc, oftentimes to, to secure their, uh, the, their position as a dominant group will oftentimes resort to discrimination and other forms uh, of political marginalization as well. For the art, out group, what ends up happening is, uh, what I argue here is racialized group finds solidarity and, excuse me, Let's say commonality within themselves as well, right? Um, and this will lead me uh, to the, uh, what I, uh, what, excuse me, not what I call, well, what uh, uh, Michael Dawson, a scholar from the University of Chicago, argues is a blank utility, utility heuristic. Um, and again, one way to think about this is um, think about this as like an information shortcut. So an information shortcut, well, the way uh, I would argue, would, would argue that it. Excuse me. The way an information shortcut works is, again, it's really impossible for your average voter to know every single policy platform uh, of each candidate, to you know, uh, take the time to read in detail every initiative and referenda, uh, and so on, right? That is just a huge burden that we often like to put on uh, individual voters. So we oftentimes use shortcuts, right? Shortcuts can take a multitude of forms. So, for example, a shortcut can be uh, maybe I, I, I identify as you know a, a strong um, supporter of the Sierra, the Sierra Club, right? Um, and if the Sierra Club says vote for candidate X because they're you know they have good policy on the environment conservation, vote for you know for candidate Y because you know uh, they would you know do something about carbon tax and so on. I can use that as an information shortcut, right? I don't necessarily have to know the specifics. I know that I agree with the Sierra Club and they're saying vote for this policy or this candidate and I do the same thing, right? But what Michael Dawson argues is uh, for African Americans, there, there's a thing called the black utility heuristic which operates some, uh, some, some way like a, a shortcut. But he argues that because race has been the predominant factor in, in black lives, uh, it is much more efficient for them to use uh, the status of the group, both relative and absolute, as a proxy for individual utility. Uh, in other words, um, in, in other words, what, it, what it's getting at is what candidate or what policy is going to best serve the black community, right? Um, and if we think about you know decision making and decision making in that terms, it becomes a lot easier to narrow down our preferred candidate or our preferred policy. So this is where linked faith comes in. So he, he also suggests that black voters approach elections with one simple question, which candidate is better for the African American community, right? Um, obviously you want to vote for a candidate that is gonna express your interest, that's gonna advocate on your behalf. Um, and, and so what he ends up saying is, again, if you have a strong affinity for, for your group and, and you think that, again, that the best way to advocate for your group is, is kind of looking at it with this question, the more likely that group is going to stick together, right? So again, if, if, we, if we think about, we'll get into, we'll get into here in a minute. Uh, if we think about like how linked fate is operating, is just a, a strong affinity towards your group, right? In, in terms of suggesting that, again, uh, which candidate is going to be better for, for your community, uh, that candidate is going to be uh, the preferred choice, right? What he also argues, though, it just doesn't come out of anywhere, right? It just doesn't. It just doesn't uh, say like, okay, because I'm Latino, I'm going to support a Latino candidate, or because I'm Latino, uh, I'm going to support you know this policy, right? It, it, what he argues is it comes out. Uh, at least what he argues it emerges from a cent at least for African Americans, I should clarify, emerges from a centuries-long history grounded in again experience of racial subjugation and discrimination, produce a common bond, a common bond among Black communities. So the idea is, 
political, there should be political differences based not just on race but also on class, right? So again, the, the argument here is, in, so let me go back to this slide here. So again, why are low-income African Americans voting in majority the same way as their affluent counterparts, right, in the same community? Why are, you know, a Latino, low-income, low-income Latinos, middle-class Latinos, or affluent Latinos voting the same way, right? Because politics would dictate is, uh, again, what's best for low-income individuals maybe is not best for affluent individuals, right? But at the same time, we still see majorities voting in a similar fashion here. So, let me get back to this. So the argument here is, again, discrimination and subjugation plays a pretty big role in, again, um, uh, unifying certain groups. And again, what he argues is, it doesn't, so again, and he kind of does, like a, kind of his, his research is mostly around post-civil rights era and so on. Is, so it doesn't matter if you're uh, fluent and African-American or uh, low-income and African-American. Uh, under, again, the regime of Jim Crow and so on, you were treated the same, right? And again, the after effects of that is we still see African Americans um, at higher rates being arrested, incarcerated, and so on, right? So again, it doesn't, what he's trying to argue here, it doesn't matter based on, on class or anything, is there's a common bond that's created amongst certain groups based on this history of sub history of subjugation and discrimination, right? Uh, a famous, uh, again, the kind of, the, one counterpoint to this would be, okay, that was, you know, the era of the, you know, Jim Crow, civil rights, and so forth. Does that actually explain it contemporarily, right? So one example that I like to use is, again, uh, uh, like policing and surveillance and so on. Again, we had, a, if, if you are familiar with um, uh, Henry, excuse me, um, professor from Harvard, Henry Louis Gates, I think is his name is. Uh, right, so he's a pro black professor from Harvard, well-educated, well-respected public figure, public intellectual. Yet he was trying to get in his own home and stopped by the police. Right. So again, it doesn't. The idea is, it doesn't matter if you're affluent or not. Uh, under the uh, under our history uh, of racism, discrimination, or anything else, creates this common bond among certain groups. Right. So go, coming back back to uh, the in-group out-group kind of uh, diagram again. Uh, it, it, what he was really trying to argue is this long history of racial discrimination, uh, subjugation, and so on. What it really does is it, it, it racializes groups, and it, what groups end up doing is some, uh, creating solidarity and, and commonality with with, with among themselves, right? And this is stemming from again uh, in groups uh, using discrimination against the out groups in multitude in a multitude of ways, and we'll get into some of these examples. So again. We'll, we'll try to see if this also works with Latino, uh, the Latino experience or Latino individuals. Because again, if we remember, uh, Michael Dawson argues that this, he argues that it works for African Americans because of this long shared history, right? So again, we, it, we, we don't necessarily have to go all the way back to slavery, because again, we have Jim Crow, we have the Civil Rights era, we have the, the, the era of mass incarceration, and so on, right? So we don't have to go all the way back. What he's saying is, that's a pretty, ch a, a huge chunk of time where African Americans were essentially treated as inferior and ultimately treated the same uh, uh, going across class lines, right? But does it actually work for uh, the Latino experience? So the question, does the faith work the same way for other racial and ethnic, uh, uh, ethnic minority groups in the US as it does for black Americans? Um, there's some evidence that it does. So 72% uh, of Latinos say their, su their success depends on the success of other Latinos and Hispanics in the country, right? So again, this is the uh, idea of linked faith. The idea of linked faith, again, is reiterating is if, if the group as a whole is doing well, my individual self is going to be doing well, right? Um, at least for when we uh, poll Latinos, uh, they're kind of responding in a similar fashion. And again, 76% of Latinos also believe that, uh, believe, uh, excuse me, type over here, that an anti-immigrant or anti-Latino environment exists today. So again, this idea of discrimination really uh, um, uh, creating solidarity and commonality within particular groups, right? So again, the idea is, Maybe it doesn't work for Latinos because again, Latinos are um, a pretty diverse group, right? Uh, they they come from uh, multiple different areas. Um, so the idea is maybe Latinos 
more probably identify with their national origin instead of kind of like their ethnic group, right? Um, what we end up seeing here is that's not necess necessarily the case. So this is all Latino regardless of national origin. Said so that yes, su the success uh, of the group depends on the success of other Latinos, right? So again, we're still seeing some form of linked fate. Um, Immigra immigration status and kind of like immigration policy is oftentimes considered kind of just to be lumping all Latinos into kind of like the same bucket, and we'll get into whether that's actually fair. Yeah. Just a quick clarification question in the five categories of race, mm -hmm. Latino and Hispanic is not categorized as a race per se. It's, if you're selecting it as sure. other race, do you think that that is part of the development of the stigma behind it? Why that, that environment exists? Yeah, so definitely, right? So you're, you're definitely correct. The, the kind of category of Latino or Hispanic is not considered a race. Uh, but again, it's still considered an ethnic group um, uh, for a couple different reasons. But again, the main idea co uh, coming from this is, again, the long history that the U.S. has had on, um, um, on marginalizing other groups, right? For at least for Hispanics, for Latinos in the U.S., uh, some of it is tied to immigration policy, uh, but again, we oftentimes see is uh, non-white groups being marginalized, right? And that marginalization creates uh, solidarity and commonality within that group. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, okay, good. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so again, the idea is maybe there is not a long shared history. Maybe, you know, uh, Mexican Americans in the U.S. have a distinctly different history than, for example, Cuban Americans or Puerto Ricans in the U.S. and so on, right? But again, the, the, this tendency for the, for the A group, in this case, white Americans, to just lump them all in together, uh, does something to, soli to solidify that group in, in, in terms of having some type of commonality at the same time, right? Um, and then we'll get into Asian American experience. So again, can we extend this idea of linked faith that was operationalized specifically for the black community? Can we extend it out to other you know, ethnic and, and racial groups at the same time? So same question, uh, as things get better for Asian Americans in general, things get better for me. And it was asked in terms of whether you strongly, you strongly agree, all the way to strongly disagree. Again, 73% of Asian Americans said they, they agreed with, the, with, with that statement, right? As things get better for the group in general, things will probably get better for the individual themselves, right? Uh, again, the, uh, the acknowledgement that Asians are lumped together uh, visually uh, as well as by the U.S. government as a racial category provides a foundation for a racial identity that is directed uh, towards politics. I'm sorry, this, this wasn't how I was supposed to show, but it keeps getting cut off. Um, so, again, so again, Asian Americans are even more diverse than Latinos, right? Not only do are they distinctive in language, in religions, uh, geographically, and so on, right? So again, what what commonality or anything like that is happening to you know uh, to to um, uh, to solidify them in, into a group? Uh, what we have again is go, what I mentioned at the beginning is this this long history of discrimination and subjugation in the United States, right? So we know Asian Americans are treated slightly different from other uh, minoritized groups. Uh, in this case, uh, this comes from uh, Claire Kim's uh, book, Racial Triangulation. And she argues that there's a couple things happening here, right? So we have on this XY axis, we have uh, uh, on the Y axis, insiders and foreigners, right? So insiders would be uh, uh, African Americans, uh, uh, white Americans in the United States as, as American citizens. On, on, on to the left we have foreigners, right? And on the x-axis we have superior and inferior. So American history, the way we position certain racial groups as, as African Americans have historically been seen as insiders but also, also inferior to their white counterparts. Asian Americans on the other hand, they have perpetually been uh, uh, deemed as uh, perpetual foreigners, right? So we have them over here, but at the same time, we have relative valorization towards Asian Americans in terms of being better than their African American counterparts, but at the same time lower than their white counterparts. So we kind of peg them as here. here. Um, and so this kind of creates this racial triangulation, right? Where there, we don't treat Asian Americans uh, quite as badly as their African American counterparts, but at the same time, we, we never quite see them as full American citizens either, right, at the same time. So again, what Claire, what, what Claire Kim and others try to argue here is, 
again, this long history uh, of, of discrimination, of prejudice surrounding uh, particular uh, uh, racial and ethnic groups really does a lot to uh, solidify them in, in, into a group. Uh, so again, so we'll get into political mobilization. How does this actually translate uh, to actually uh, political activity? And again, oftentimes when people like to go back all the way back to the civil rights movement and so on, we can definitely come up with more contemporary examples. So again, we see the Black Lives Matter movement uh, be a, a pretty big uh, voice and force in terms of advocating for black rights. Um, and again, the, the idea is if you've seen kind of like uh, demonstrations, been to a protest, seen kind of like blog posts and, and just uh, different narratives coming out of the Black Lives Matter movement, advocating in terms of, uh, again, I am what the poster for this session had is, am I next, right? If the, if the status quo continues as it is, um, am I the one gonna be uh, the next victim to it, right? So again, it, 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 what it does, it, it spurs mobilization uh, among different individuals. But the kind of, the key takeaway is, the individual has to kind of conceptualize that their individual fate is linked to the group as a whole, right? Um, in this case, we can look at Black Lives Matter for that. Uh, down here, I have an image of, of, of protests by uh, DACA recipients or other uh, undocumented folks in terms of we need some kind of protection for, for this marginalized group as well, right? And what we've seen here coming out of this is, again, uh, a, a broad alliance coming to support undocumented folks, whether they've been, there are, uh, you know, legal immigrants, whether they are undocumented immigrants, or whether they are third, fourth generation Latinos or Hispanics living in the U.S. at the same time, right? Um, but the other thing that's also happening, um, and, and this uh, logo or t-shirt comes from uh, a group called Undocumedia, um, that's been really uh, kind of ad big advocates for undocumented individuals in the United States. Um, again, kind of uh, taking now a, a more intersectional approach, right? So again, the teacher reads, love is love, water is life, black lives matter, no Muslim registry, uh, trans is beautiful, Im immigrant rights, immigrants make America great, women's rights are human rights, right? So again, uh, this is now taking a slightly different approach in terms of does discrimination in itself spur mobilization, right? Across racial or, or socioeconomic lines or, or anything like that. What we've seen with Black Lives Matter movement is uh, a movement definitely led by a black activist, but we've also seen uh, a multitude of other supporters within as well. Uh, same issues happening here with kind of like a, 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 a mobilization around uh, you know, a, clean, uh, a clean immigration bill uh, and a pathway to citizenship. Again, but most of this is again pushing back, pushing back against injustice, right? And again, the idea for Michael Dawson, uh, if we can go back to here, is there's a lot of history in the United States of marginalizing uh, non-white groups, and that marginalization, that discrimination, is what uh, tends to be the impetus for political mobilization at the same time, right? But again, what Michael Dawson also argues is uh, the individual has to has to have some kind of affinity towards their group. They have to believe that their individual life chances are tied to the group as a whole. Um, and any questions up until now? So what I wanted to do is um, uh, kind of go back to this, right? So again, uh, this is the results for the 2016 presidential election. We see, again, non-white groups overwhelmingly voting uh, in favor of the Democratic candidate, Hillary Clinton here. Again, so the idea is, so if Link Faith, the argument is if Link Faith wasn't operating or wasn't, uh, you know, being oper operationalized the way we're, we're kind of like theoretically thinking about it, we should see some major deviations here, right? We should see, again, uh, uh, wealthier individuals in, in these groups uh, supporting the Republican Party, right? Because the Republican Party has been seen as the party for, you know, tax breaks, the party for, you know, wealthy individuals and so on. But at the same time is we don't see that in actual results, right? A part of it maybe is Donald Trump was just a, a bad candidate at the time, right? That couldn't uh, cater to the needs of maybe a middle class and, a, and affluent uh, non-white groups. But this is, has historically been the trend though, right? In terms of non-white groups uh, overwhelmingly supporting the Democratic candidate, right? Non-white groups overwhelmingly supporting uh, candidates that have, you know, that, that are willing to preserve uh, issues uh, around civil rights and, and liberties, right? Um, any, any questions here? Yeah. So, uh, with movements like Black Lives Matter, sometimes uh, 
you've you've seen uh, we have seen like another counter movement such as all lives matter. Sure. Can we call that mobilization or it's I mean, it's a good. Yeah. What category do we put that? Kind good. Of, uh, yeah. Good. Um, good. And, and and on here is what the research show is: Does linked fate also work for white individuals? Right. The, the answer is. Uh, kind of murky, right? So when we ask the question in terms of do, do you th do you believe your life chances are tied to the group as a whole? Most white individuals will say will answer it in the negative, right? In terms of like no, and no, it doesn't. So the particular thing is, uh, is it, can anybody kind of guess or have a uh, kind of like a theoretical thinking of what kind of white individual will say that yes, their individual life chances depends on the the, the safety of the white group as a whole. <laughs> Is it um, people who think that it's not taken over by immigrants? So close, it's not necessarily. Uh, so that's uh, that kind of, from what I've seen, that mostly falls on like kind of class based issues with some kind of like racial resentment to it. But you really, really close though. So, uh, if kind of like a, let's, let's unpack that a little, a little bit more. So uh, just for clarification, what you're asking for is uh, what. Uh, Types of whites would have the uh, link sh uh, shared link fake. Exactly. Yeah. And so, I would say probably the best answer to that is the Jewish community. So, so they're, they're still considered an ethnic minority, right? In terms of they're, they're distinct from like their 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 um, dominant uh, ang Anglo white counterpart. So close. I mean, you're getting definitely getting close. Any, anybody else? So what what kind of like group within like the white uh, community would say like yes my individual life chances is dependent on the success of the group as a whole? Oh, a supremacist. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah, exactly. So somebody said <laughs> so white nationalists in general, right? They would definitely fall into this belief of linked fate uh, as well. And what we've seen at, at least uh, uh, at least here in Seattle when white nationalists are mobilized and organized, it's around like again preserving their cultural heritage is around preserving you know dominance uh, of uh, uh, of their group right so yeah so it, it definitely works on that other side as well so like you're mentioning right so does it does it work to spur other groups like maybe people will say like maybe all lives matter right um, I say that's kind of a tricky answer because for most whites they would say like no my individual life chances are not dependent on the group as a whole but there is one segment and those tend to be white nationalists that, that do that Definitely uh, uh, the room for uh, 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 response bias, right? Uh, again, uh, when we're so kind of like for example, the 2016 elections, a lot of people thought Hillary Clinton was gonna it was gonna be an easy win, right? Because all the polls were showing she was up X number of points. That could have been because a lot of people that were actually supporting Trump didn't want to say that they were supporting Trump, and so they said either denied answering the question or said the other candidate, right? So there could definitely be response bias to that. There's definitely room for that. Um, what ends up happening, at least with these studies, is we can mitigate that in terms of uh, by asking some kind of other question. So, uh, in terms of uh, again, if on a survey, most individuals, if you ask them, you know, do you think African Americans are inferior to whites, you would probably want to you get skewed results, right? Nobody would want to admit that they're discriminatory or have prejudices or anything, right? But the other way around that could be, you know, is do you support, you know, uh, NFL protest, NFL players protesting the national anthem during the national anthem, and so on, right? As kind of a, a, a way to control for that, for sure. Uh, in this case, what we end up seeing is um, similar questions coming up in terms of asking the individual, do you think your individual life chances are tied to the group as a whole? Um, one, uh, a couple of things uh, to do that, uh, I think to go away uh, around that is uh, to um, uh, follow up on the question is. 
if you can choose between, uh, again, um, if you're an African American, between a black candidate and a white candidate, who would be your preferred candidate? Right? Oftentimes what we see is African Americans will overwhelmingly support uh, um, their preferred candidate, oftentimes as a black candidate. Latino Americans, uh, their turnout rate goes, uh, jumps significantly enough when there's a Latino candidate on the ballot as well and so on, right? So again, coming back to the idea is uh, racial, uh, racial and ethnic minorities, what they end up doing is voting for, for the candidate that has their best interests in mind, right? Not, not, the individual, me, not, their individual, not their individual interests, but their group's interests in mind, right? So again, we see African Americans, Latinos, and Asian Americans overwhelmingly supporting the Democratic candidate that you know wasn't as you know using dog whistles during the election, wasn't you know uh, you know uh, uh, picking uh, excuse me uh, using racial resentment to mobilize their base, right? Uh, so we see this uh, we see this uh, happening here. So I wonder if there is a different uh, levels of discrimination, for example, African American versus uh, African immigrants. Sure. Um, how, good. How, how do you measure that? Good. So, um, so that's a really good question. So again, this, this idea of, of excuse me, so what we've seen before is pushback in terms of you can't really use the concept of linked fate to other groups, right? Because again, for Latinos is uh, again they're 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 they're, they're a panathin group, right? So they come from a multitude of countries that have a multitude of cultures and customs, right? So it, it might be hard to say like they all kind of like lump in together and support each other. Because again, what I said earlier, right? The experience of a Mexican-American in the Southwest can be vastly different from a Cuban-American in Florida, right? Um, and kind of the same thing goes to your question here, right? So in terms of like new waves uh, of immigrant groups coming into the country, right? Does uh, a black immigrant have uh, the same kind of like uh, history or experience as an African-American that's been here for, uh, for a very long time, right? Generations and generations. Um, what uh, ultimately, what, what this, what this uh, theory would ultimately argue is, is go back to this, right? Uh, it hinges upon this history of discrimination. So again, the idea, it, it doesn't matter if you've been in the United States for generations or you're a new immigrant. Uh, if you're not white, you're going to experience some form of dis discrimination, right? And that's the discrimination is the impetus to mobilize individuals and to kind of like find a, find a, find a group that, ha that shares your interests, right? To uh, be politically active and therefore advocate for your own interests. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. I don't want to problematize your no. data, no. but um, under white, <clears throat> technically Arabs will fit under there yeah. because ethnically they're Caucasian. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that yeah, <laughs> they do sure. not uh, affiliate. Uh, I mean, for sure. yeah. so it might be a time, you know, it might be the right time for us to kind of look at, to ask different sure. questions or to get yeah. different data or to mine yeah. different data or even to define that, that awful question that comes up in so many forms and applications. Yeah, for sure. What race are you for or sure. what ethnicity yeah. are you? Definitely. It's just so... Yeah, so definitely. Um, uh, and I can definitely, for those of you interested, for you the, the, the studies that I've looked at, the data that I've looked at. And in this case, these are public opinion polls. At least public opinion polls will differentiate between uh, North African and Middle Eastern individuals from uh, white individuals, right? You're definitely correct in terms of government forms. They lump the, the, those groups into it. Uh, at least from, from my knowledge, is the 2020 census is going to try to create a new meta category, so like Middle Eastern, North African, to differentiate that experience from uh, what we consider, you know, Anglo Christian white individuals in the country, right? Uh, so yeah, so thank you. Um, at least in this, I, I don't uh, necessarily uh, expand this to uh, Middle Eastern people from uh, coming from the Middle East or have Middle East descent or North African descent for sure. Uh, but that's something definitely uh, to to uh, clarify on. Any questions? So uh, we have uh, not too much time. Uh, I wanted to do a quick exercise. Um, um, if we have time, and hopefully at least we'll have some uh, discussion at your individual tables. Um, and if you have a piece of paper with you, or uh, I can really will be passing a sheet of paper, uh, what I want you to do is consider this question here. How has your identity helped or hindered your ability to move freely in our society? Kind of think about that. Um, and again, you get to identify how, however you want. It doesn't necessarily have to be on racial or ethnic lines either. And then kind of like sit on that question, come up with the response to that question, and then we'll have a, a brief discussion around it here as well.
And again, um, write down anything that you feel comfortable sharing, you know, uh, try to uh, be anonymous about it. What I want you to do is write down your response to this question, kind of crumple it up and, and leave it at the center of your table. After you write a response to your question, I want you to pick out somebody else's response and have a discussion about that and kind of see where differences may be, where, where similarities may lie with your individual experiences. Once you have a, a response to uh, the prompt here, just uh, mix it in with your group. And hopefully, what I want you to do is pick one pick a response that's not yours and kind of like reflect on it for a bit. And we can briefly have uh, a short conversation around it. <laughs> Yeah, 
uh, th this history of discrimination, not just uh, pr particularly on African Americans, but other groups as well. Uh, what this what this theory argues is uh, binds groups together, solidifies them, and to mobilize into local action as well. And oftentimes we see that um, the easiest case for being represented in terms of how the action we vote in, in politics. And again, uh, I thank you for, for your time and, and, and patience here and your cooperation with the exercise. I uh, thank you for Please, everybody, join me in thanking Jose. Okay. I'm not sure if there's any additional time or folks have questions that they might want to ask one on one. Then, if they, if you have questions, then feel free to talk to them. I'm passing out the survey because I mentioned at the beginning that I'm planning next quarter.